So uh, yesterday, what we have done is we have looked at the methods on how to generate uh, sequencing data. Um, we have mainly focused on Illumina data, with, but we have also shortly looked on uh, long read uh, sequencers. Um, and of course, you have done the quality control on uh, a data set that wasn't very good and that you could quite well improve uh, with uh, adapter trimming and, and read base quality trimming. So after you did the quality control on uh, your sequencing reads, so on your FASTQ files, usually a next step, depending a little bit on the application, but usually a next step would be read alignment against a reference genome. That's what this presentation is about, and that's what you will later do in the exercises. So uh, what you have seen is a FASTQ file, either a raw FASTQ file, let's say, and a trimmed one. And what you then uh, usually have is a reference genome, a reference sequence. Depends, of course, very much on the organism on how good the quality of that reference uh, sequence actually is. So of course, for human and mouse or Arabidopsis, um, or Drosophila, for example, you can expect that that reference sequence is of, of relatively high quality, although there are always gaps in there, so missing, missing pieces. But you can assume that it is quite complete. And for other organisms where uh, there is only a very basic assembly, for example, uh, you'd have to do with a less good uh, FASTA file, a less good reference genome. And that can also mean that that has implications for, uh, for example, the read alignment and for the downstream analyses. Anyway, so we assume you have a reference genome and what an aligner does, it for each read, uh, it tries to find the most likely position on the reference genome where it could have, let's say, originated from uh, in the sample you have actually been, been sequencing. So what an aligner does, it finds for each of these reads a position on the reference genome. And that information is stored in a SOM file. And the SOM file is, well, yet another very well-known file that is used in bioinformatics. If you compress it, it's called a BOM file. More on that later on. Uh, what is stored there is, are those positions where those reads align to the reference genome. And the aligner is there to generate that sample. Um, this is how uh, a sample looks if you visualize it. So um, I think at least some of you, if not all of you, have seen such a visualization before. This is one particularly from ITV. And what you see over here are paired and reads, <clears throat> where you see the forward and reverse reads. Uh, linked by a small line, and that small line is that that part that is not sequenced of the of the fragment, and all the likely alignments to the reference genome. Uh, you also see some colors there, and those are mismatches between the read and the reference genome. And all that information, uh, where it aligns, uh, where the mismatches are, are stored in that thumb file, and that's generated by the aligner. So how do these aligners work? In principle, it's pretty, pretty basic, pretty simple. Uh, the aim is to find substrings, which would be the sequence reads in a large string. And of course, um, in, in many cases, that might be exact matches. So where the read exactly aligns precisely to the reference genome. But also in many cases, it is not an exact match, but a nearly exact match. So the substrings would be the reads, and the large string would be the reference genome. However, typically, we're looking at millions of substrings, if not hundreds of millions, sometimes even billions, um, of substrings that you want to find in a very large substring that can be tens of millions of characters long, or even more. So um, that is a computational challenge. So um, if you would just do that, uh, let's say by hand, what you would do is take your read and try to find, try to match it at every possible place 
on the reference genome and see where it matches. Of course, if you want to do that for millions of reads in tens of millions of characters, that is the reference genome that will take really forever, literally forever. So we need to do something to speed this up. One way to do this, or what's very often done in um, bioinformatics is uh, something called indexing. So indexing is done on many large files in bioinformatics, and you can of course also index a reference genome. Basically what you do is kind of, is kind of generate a phone book of your reference genome in order to uh, enable these fast searches. So it doesn't take forever to find that particular match of that read under in the reference genome. Um, and that is done often like this, or at least as a starter. So what you do is basically take the entire uh, reference genome and um, basically take off uh, one bit of the start and then um, do that for the entire reference genome. So let's say we have a reference uh, like this, so T A A T A dollar sign. Of course, usually your reference genome is much, much bigger, but this is a very small reference genome of only five base pairs, of course, for simplicity. Then we take, uh, let's say, all the shorter substrings of this reference genome and put it in a table. So we have this T A T. So the full reference genome, we take off the T and then we add it there and so on and so on. So you can already kind of imagine that if you are searching here, you can already find some. Uh, substrings if you're looking for them. However, you make this more efficient by alphabetically ordering this matrix over here. And we order it by uh, the nucleotide. And here the dollar sign, by the way, I should have mentioned that the dollar sign uh, always depicts the end and that can be relevant later on. And that's also relevant for a suffix array, by the way. Um, and that's always the, the starting point. So alphabetically, the dollar sign always comes first. So we alphabetically order uh, our substrings um, and then we get something that is called a suffix array. So if you have worked with bioinformatic algorithms before, then you probably have heard of a suffix array before because it is a concept that is used quite frequently. You can already see from the suffix array um, that, well, probably uh, searching goes pretty fast. For, for, for example, if you have a read starting with an A, you only have to search in row four, one, and two in this case, or the second, the third, and the fourth row. So that all already goes a bit faster than going through the entire reference genome. What you can also see is that we have a relatively small reference, but we store this reference almost like three times in the suffix array. So the suffix array can be done pretty big. Okay, so apparently the animations aren't that great. Daniela has a question. Yes, I was wondering, I mean, this is for whole genome sequencing, right? So in my case that I do amplicon sequencing, do I mm -hmm. still put the whole genome as a reference or I put the amplicons of my wild type organism and then, because then the amplicons are the lengths of the reads, right? So it wouldn't need to find where it is. Yeah. Well, um, indeed for you, it will be uh, relatively easier uh, because you probably also have way fewer reads and you know where you want to align your reads. However, um, you do, of course, a PCR on your entire genome, on your entire DNA. So there can be, uh, for example, amplifications of regions that, you, that, that are, for example, similar to your target region. Um, um, and that are still part of the genome. And sometimes that information is relevant to know. So that would mean, in principle, what you could do is just take your target region as a reference and just align uh, your, your PCR, uh, so your amplicon sequencing reads on there. However, that would also mean that you would force reads that actually come from a different region in the genome onto your target region, which actually might not uh, originate from there. So even for amplicon sequencing, I would say it's relevant to take the entire reference genome and align your reads against uh, that reference genome, and then take only the part that you're interested in for variant calling. And of course, also check 
where we end up that are not in your target region, just as a quality control to see whether you haven't been amplifying part of the genome that you are not interested in. Mm, okay, thank you. All right, you're welcome. So I am going to give you the full slide because the animations uh, are a little bit messed up. Sorry about that. So if you start the query, this suffix array, um, that is um, much faster than just looking at the reference genome as a whole, because what you can do is a binary search. And binary search is much faster than, let's say, a linear search. I think you call that a linear search, where you just search for the entire uh, reference genome. So what you do is, let's say you have a query called ATA. Well, we can already see that it directly fits over here at this part. Uh, but of course, the genome is usually much, much larger. So what you do is you start in the middle of a suffix array and see where you uh, where your query has to be. So at the upper part or the lower part. Now we see that it has to be at the lower part because the middle has AA. So we have to go lower. Then we split that again, see we have to go up or down. And then we see we have to go up and we directly have our match. So with a bigger reference genome, that's of course a much larger ref, uh, suffix array. So you usually have way more steps uh, in your binary search, but your binary search is way faster than, uh, let's say, a linear search where you search the entire, entire genome. So that's a step forward. We did do have a suffix array, which is much larger than our reference genome, but our searching is much faster. So that's already quite nice. However, we have this huge suffix array. And for big genomes, that can really go up to uh, hundreds of gigabytes. <clears throat> so um, there is a solution for that, and it's a very elegant uh, solution, and that is the burroughs wheeler transformation. So our suffix array is very large. We store the same sequence multiple times, but what you do with the burroughs wheeler transformation is that you only store the first and the last column of our suffix array. So in principle, what you can do is take the suffix array, but um, include all the sequences that come after that. So you kind of circularize your reference genome. So if we look at, for example, uh, let's say this line, line, the third line, line one, um, we have our, oops, we have our uh, full reference genome that is P-A-A-T-A -A -A, and a dollar sign. It would mean that the Burr's really transformation would have still a T on the, in the end. So in each line, basically, you store the entire reference genome. Um, and um, you do that for the entire suffix array. So we have the burroughs wheeler transformation over here. But that's not the full burroughs wheeler transformation. So this matrix would, of course, be, uh, again, huge. It will be, uh, the, I think, quadratic uh, size of the reference genome. But what not, what's nice about burroughs wheeler transformation is that you only if you only store the first column, and the last column, you can always go back to your full reference genome and fill the, uh, you can do binary searches. So what we do over here is basically the first column, you can already see that, is just the alphabetic order of all the A's, B's, C's, and G's in your reference genome. Well, the last column is, something different, that's uh, quite a specific order, but with this first and this last column, you can completely reconstruct your reference genome and you can do directly with this first and last column, these binary searches. How that exactly works takes a little bit too long to explain, but you can now just assume that just by storing this first and this last column, it's called the burroughs wheeler transformation. And that concept is used by most of the frequently used uh, uh, aligners. Is this a bit clear for you? At least a little bit of the content. Yeah, so this stop, step from Burroughs Wheeler transformation to binary searching, uh, that's still a bit of a long step to go, but it, uh, you require quite a few steps to really understand what's going on. 
Nice to know is that the birth relay transformation is usually smaller or at least as big as the reference genome. So you do not require a lot of disk space to store it. Second. Sorry about that. So about aligners in general, there you can use global or local alignment. So you can try to match the entire read to the reference genome, and you always do that. If it does not uh, align completely, then you will have penalties, meaning that you have, for example, a reduction in uh, the likeliness that a read should actually align at a position. Um, and there is local alignment. And local alignment tries to align only parts of, of your reads. So that means that it would allow for clipping meaning that you can, uh, the aligner only uh, aligns, for example, the middle part of the read to a reference genome and then removes, just ignores the outer parts of the, of the reference genome. Both have their advantages and uh, disadvantages, um, but what you usually do is you use global or local alignment in different situations, depending mostly on your organism, for example. Uh, you can imagine if there is a, are, if there are a lot of mismatches of insertions, deletions expected between your reads and the reference genome. For example, if you're aligning your reads to a related species to the samples you're actually sequencing, then it's often a better idea to use uh, local alignment. Um, if you uh, if the reference genome is very similar to the reads you're actually sequencing, you actually usually do not want this soft clipping to happen because that might lead to spurious alignments, that alignments that are actually not true aren't supposed to align, and therefore you might choose for global alignment. I have a question for you, and I think that's a bit related to this, or it should be related to this at least. So the question is, um, actually, it is kind of what I just said. So suppose you want to align reads to a reference. In which cases would you use a global aligner and when would you use a local aligner? So local would enable, allow for this clipping and global would try to align the entire read. And stop. And of course, most of you are correct, I think. So global alignment if the query and reference are similar and local, local if unsimilar. So that's like typically how you would use them. Of course, there are also um, uh, use cases where you are only are interested on, on, in specific parts of the, of the genome, for example, that has a lot of indels, then you might also consider to use either local if, if the indels are very large, for example, you have very small reads or the other way around, if you are very much, if you really want to align the entire read. Yeah. So software, how to actually perform that practically, these align these alignments. So for, let's say, basic alignments, meaning, uh, for example, genomic uh, reads to genomic sequences, um, most popular still would be Bowtie 2 and BWAMM. They're both based on uh, really the basic Burroughs relay transformation. So the Burroughs relay transformation, as I just tried to explain it to you. However, they are they are slightly different, um, and and that the difference is mainly in the default settings. So if you use both I two, then the default is a global alignment, meaning that you try to align the full read uh, to the reference genome, and BWA. There, the default is a local alignment. And for both of them, you can make them local or global. So you can have local alignment with both I2, only have to change the settings and the thing counts for BWA. And usually, um, if you change the setting, they have very similar results in terms of alignment. Then you also have spliceware aligners. So if you work with RNA-seq data, uh, then you have probably heard of, for example, HiSet2, which is based on a very similar algorithm and are, is also developed by the same authors as Bowtie2 and TAR2. 
Uh, you probably have heard of STAR before. So they're both splice-aware aligners, which would mean that you can align reads that are generated from transcripts to a genome that has splice type. So if you work with a bacteria, that's not very relevant. You can always use both that tool and BWA. However, if you work with a eukaryote, then of course you have uh, splicing. So you have intronic sequences in your reference genome. And if you are going to align your RNA seq reads to your reference genome, then of course you have to take these introns into account. So what you basically do with splicer aligners, you have your messenger RNA and you generate reads from your messenger RNA, and then you are aligning your reads to the reference genome with these introns in there. So there are some splice sites in there. Um, both I2 and BWA, if you uh, would use those to uh, align your reads to genomic DNA, they will just find a lot of penalties find, and therefore a lot of problems. Um, with, with aligning in these uh, intronic regions or with these intronic regions, while high set 2 and star take these intronic regions into account and will not give a penalty if there are introns. Um, then a little bit more modern aligner that's also a bit more versatile than the above is Minimap 2. Uh, I guess it, it's gaining quite a bit of popularity. So it is initially, it was uh, developed mainly for to be able to properly align long reads, so reads coming from PacBio or, or, or Oxford Nanopore technology, but you can also align short reads with it and you, it can also be used for splice-aware alignment. So you can do long reads splice-aware alignment and short reads splice-aware alignment all with Minimap 2. Also partly based on the Burroughs really transformation, but it's a bit more uh, sophisticated. Then a few words about mapping quality. So what uh, happens very often is, let's say you have a genome and you have two regions on the genome that are very similar to each other. For example, uh, caused by a transposable element or uh, a recent gene uh, duplication, for example. Uh, so let's say these blue parts, they are very similar to each other and the screen part is generally unique. So it's easy to align reads to the green part, but if you have a read from the blue part, then you're not entirely sure whether it should align at this first part, at this first blue part, or at, at, at the second blue part, because the reads can come from both of those regions. And that information is depicted in the mapping quality. So the mapping quality says something about how sure the aligner was that the position in the genome is the correct position. And nice thing is that this mapping quality is calculated in the same way as base quality. So it's also using this FRET, uh, FRET score, but now not on the probability that the base is wrong, but on the probability that the mapping position is wrong. So what the aligner does is calculate the probability that the mapping position is wrong, do does this FRET score transformation in order to give you a, a score. So if you uh, are 99% sure that, or if the aligner is 99% sure that the mapping position is correct, then you have a probability the mapping, that the mapping position is wrong of 0 0.01, and therefore you have a mapping quality of 20. So high mapping qualities means good, uh, a, a good mapping so that the aligner was sure that the reads actually belongs there. If you have low mapping qualities, for example, mapping quality of three, which would mean that you have 50% chance that mapping position is wrong. So that would, uh, for example, be the case in, uh, in the example above where you're not sure where the blue reads are coming from, you get a low mapping quality of three and often that is even zero. So then the aligner was completely unsure where the reads actually should belong and therefore it gives it a random position. And that can, of course, give, give problems if you are, for example, interested in, interested in variant analysis, or if you uh, are, the, uh, for example, counting for RNA-seq analysis. That's it, considering this presentation. Are there any further questions regarding read alignment? Sophia has a question. 
Yes. So um, what will happen in the event that you have a sequence that can actually come from two different genomic uh, locations? Are they just mapped to both and they tell you that this is not very sure? Or can you disregard yeah. them or how does it work? So that would be indeed exactly this uh, situation. Um, so it, it, uh, it's a setting on both Bowtie and BWA, BWA what the aligner will do with such mm -hmm. a read. But usually it will just give it a random place. So not a random place over the entire genome, but it will align it to either one of those positions. And then okay. it will give a mapping quality of zero. So it will align it, but okay. it will say, I'm going to align it here, but I'm completely unsure where it should be here. Okay. Okay. And will it so, tell you what, let's say, if there would be two possibilities for alignment of the sequence, it will align it to one of them. It will tell you that he's not very sure. Will he tell you what the other position could be or not? Uh, yes. Also, I think we can have a look at both I too. Um, so I think that would be the secondary alignment. Okay. Um, and then and then the, the position is also stored in the bomb film. Okay, good. And I Thanks. think both I too does that. Thanks. Yeah. Right. Uh, Vamsi has a question. Uh, yes, uh, sorry to repeat it. So I'm not clear with uh, why we index reference genome. Okay. Yeah, can you explain it a bit? Uh, yeah, so of course. So let's say this example. So we have ATA as a query over here. So it's three uh, nucleotides as a read, and we have the full reference over here. So in principle, computers, they are stupid, right? We have to tell them exactly what to do. So uh, a very, very naive way to find the most likely position of this query in the reference would be to just start at the beginning of the reference and see whether you have a match. So we have ATA. Um, and they're going to look for a match between in the first two nucleotides and we see TAA, so we say no, no match. Then we continue to the next one. Uh, and then we check ATA, no, not correct, next one, and so on. So and then we have the third one, and then we see a match. So that means that we have made three comparisons over here, right? To TAA, AAT, and ATA. Well, you can imagine they're a very long genome, a lot of reads that can take quite a lot of time. So we compared the read to the genome three times here. If you have a suffix array, in this case, my mouse is a bit sensitive. So in this case, uh, if you have a suffix array, we actually do only two comparisons. So we take the middle and we see, is there a match, yes or no? Then we say, okay, we have to go lower than this. So we take the middle again. And we check it again, and then we have our match. So we have only we do only two comparisons in this case. And um, so the if your genome increases in size, um, that uh, at the first um, naive way we took would scale linear, linear, linearly with the genome size, while uh, a binary search does not scale linearly with the genome size. So you usually only have a quite limited number of matches you have to do. So that's why making an index like a suffix array in this case, and then later on reverse reading transformation with this basically modified suffix array makes your searches faster. And then each and every read will go through the entire process and whole reference genome like that. Yep. Oh, okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, Michael. Um, does the choice of the software for the alignment <coughs> is influenced by whether you use it for eukaryotes or prokaryotes? Um, I am not 100% sure what is the most frequently used aligner for prokaryotes. For eukaryotes, for genomic alignments, you're usually using Bowtie 2, uh, but BWA, BWA works uh, similarly. 
I think the choices you would have to make between Proto2 and BW, BWA, for example, would be similar as uh, choices you would need to make for any other organisms. Meaning that if you expect a lot of mismatches, um, then it's probably best to take at least uh, a local aligner or a aligner that can be local. Um, if you expect uh, a lot of uh, complete matches, uh, and I think that's often the case in, in prokaryotic uh, genomes, then you can take uh, a global aligner. Okay, good. Uh, Sabrina. Um, <clears throat> yes, I was wondering uh, for the reference genome, I know that there's a different type. Uh, which one would you choose? What's the difference? But there's new, always new versions and all that. How do you decide which one to use? Um, so in terms of reference genomes, usually, um, let's say the consortia that are uh, responsible for reference genomes, they do not, they only change reference genome if there is really a significant improvement. Because changing a reference genome usually has a huge impact on running projects, meaning that all coordinates change and you would need to change all the different files. So if you have alignment files, you would need to change them, maybe redo the alignment. Um, if you have VCF files, that would need to change. So, um, well, usually it's, if you start a new project, it's a good idea to take the newest because uh, the newest usually has significant improvements if you compare it to the, the previous reference, you know. Okay, so um, there's however, never a good reason to take an old version, always the newest one, right? Yeah. Um, well, if you want to compare, for example, to previous results. Of course, um, yeah. Or if the entire project uh, was based on that, that older reference, you know, in the meantime, there was a newer, then it's always a good idea. On the other hand, the annotation, uh, so if you are, for example, interested in specific genes, they do change quite often. Um, and they, there doesn't need to be a significant, um, really a very significant uh, improvement before a annotation uh, version changes, because it usually doesn't have a big effect on downstream analysis, because genomic coordinates, they do not change. It's only, for example, do you assign this read to uh, gene A or do we rename that gene, for example, or do we have an additional isoform of a gene, for example? So usually that doesn't have a huge impact on downstream analysis. Thank you. All right. No more questions? Great. I see something in the chat. And they're not exotic organisms. No. <laughs> I was talking about exotic plants. So all the plants I've worked with have been very exotic. So that's why I was uh, mentioning. <laughs> nice. Uh, all right. So let's go have a look at the exercises. Uh, so what I would like to ask you to do is to start with the exercises regarding uh, read alignment. Um, so what you'll do is download uh, an E. coli reference genome uh, using eSearch and eFetch, so this Entree uh, eUtilities uh, software, um, and then make an index, uh, check out uh, how this, uh, well, how the files that are there that actually represent the Burroughs media transformation, how they how they look like, and then actually align the reads with both that too. So in this case, we're using a prokaryotic organisms and we're taking a um, global aligner. So both that two aligns globally by default. Uh, 